everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining this second session of PNC 101. Uh, I'm Evan Hessel, Casualty Practice Leader for Woodruff Sawyer. I My role is to lead our team of risk management and risk financing professionals designing cost and capital efficient insurance programs for large organizations. I work with a talented team of brokers, data scientists, actuaries, claim consultants, and safety operational experts to advise our clients on how to reduce their total cost of risk and build the strongest insurance program to protect their corporate balance sheet. I'd like to, I'm joined today, I'm thrilled that I'm joined today by my colleague, Terry Chirea Apreku, who leads our casualty actuarial consulting practice for Woodruff Sawyer. He provides risk financing analytics and operational uh, analytics to our clients to help them identify actionable opportunities to drive down their total cost of risk using cutting edge quantitative tools. So I'm, I'm happy to lean on Terry today to talk through some of the math and some of the statistical analysis that informs the, the strategies that we uh, develop for our clients in building uh, casualty risk financing programs. Next, please. Before we jump in into the, the content of today, I want to tell the group uh, assembled just a little bit about Woodruff Sawyer. Um, we are a privately held uh, insurance broker and consulting firm founded in 1918 in San Francisco. We're extremely proud of our strong ties to Silicon Valley in the Bay Area and take a lot of pride in our ongoing support of companies in the innovation economy. We have a, a long record of working with companies from uh, the, the beginning of their evolution when they're just an idea in the garage all the way until they become commercialized, go public and become 100 billion plus uh, market cap type operation um, and supporting companies that, that are really changing the world and disrupting the economy is, is something that we're very focused on. Um, as I mentioned, we're a privately held company. We have no outside investment from private equity funds or uh, external publicly public stockholders. That allows us to really focus on clients, invest for the future, and build a resource-rich service platform that helps clients with every aspect of their risk and their risk management program. Um, we're based throughout the United, we're based in, in San Francisco, as I said, and have operations throughout the United States. We also uh, have an office in London, and we're part of the AssureX Global Network, which is the largest, uh, the largest independent insurance network operating in essentially every country around the world. Um, to call out a couple of things where we're we're really uh, expert um, and and where we're focused, we maintain uh, specialized practices focusing on risk management, specifically risk man management casualty, which I lead, risk management property, commercial middle markets management liability, including directors and officers liability and uh, initial public offering and SPAC transactions. And finally, uh, cyber liability and employee benefits are major focuses of us. And the concepts that we're gonna talk, to, talk about today related to risk financing are focused on casualty insurance because that's the most uh, easily applicable uh, area for alternative risk financing and, and thinking through ways to restructure your insurance program. But the concepts are applicable to essentially all of those different disciplines that I just mentioned and every aspect of your uh, insurance program. Next, please. So as we start to talk about uh, as we start to talk about casualty strategy, um, I think it's important to talk about the, fo the foundations of, of risk financing first. And then what we're going to talk about are insurance market conditions that are driving some of the specific strategies that we can deploy in risk financing today. Um, you know, part of the goal of any insurance buyer, risk manager, and the brokers that support them is to react to both what's going on with your organization in terms of operational changes and claims activity, as well as what's going on in the external market. Um, and so understanding some of the, the forces that are that are underpinning all of the underwriting that's going on and some of the claims activity is really important to this. So the general the general concept of, of risk financing is to think about um, balance. Uh, risk financing is all about balancing premium spent and commercial insurance purchased versus retaining risk. Um, and to put that a little bit differently, what it's really about is 
carefully thinking through how to balance the premium savings that companies can grab by increasing the amount of retained risk in their insurance program, either via deductibles or self-insured retentions. And how do you balance that against the volatility of additional losses, either attritional losses, um, say within your deductible layers, or if you're thinking about taking on more risk in your excess casualty tower or on other severity driven lines of insurance, how do you prepare for those kinds of shock losses? So when we think about casualty insurance program design, I, I think it's helpful to break it into sort of two aspects uh, and two components of the program. The first is the primary insurance, that initial layer of insurance usually comprised of workers' compensation, general and products liability, and auto liability uh, that often has self-insured retentions or deductibles. This is the layer that's really about financing risk. Yes, you are typically gonna purchase some insurance in this layer, but you're also going to retain a lot of the risk um, or, or most large organizations are gonna retain risk in this layer. And it's really thinking through what's the optimal level of deductible, what's the optimal level of aggregate exposure to losses within this layer, and how do you structure it in a cost capital and collateral effective way um, that, that works for your organization. Excess insurance is really about balance sheet protection. This is, the, this is the umbrella layers and the excess layers that you purchase above the working layer, the, the primary layer of insurance, that is really uh, preparing and protecting your company against a catastrophic loss, whether that be a massive auto accident, a mass tort product liability claim, um, or, or any type of other loss that could really challenge the future of your company. This is where we're typically purchasing 100% risk transfer buying insurance and, and, and protecting the company. The, the key variable when you're thinking about excess insurance is really how much to buy. And uh, your, your broker and risk advisor can help you think through that. So what are some of the, uh, what are some of the factors that drive the strategy in developing the primary insurance strategy and the excess insurance strategy? There's a handful of things that are called out on the screen here, and I'm gonna point to just a few of them. I think the most important one is the risk tolerance of your organization. So where we start the process when we're working with our, our, our client partners is to carefully think through the client's ability to retain risk and their tolerance for risk. We look at key financial metrics like their, their market cap, their overall assets, their cash on hand, their working capital, their net income. And we really think through um, different insurance program scenarios where we estimate the total amount of expected losses and worst case outcome losses and how that compares to your company's financial strength and your objectives. You know, you might think about uh, the risk profile of different companies and how that could impact the way they uh, design their risk financing program. Take, for example, a, a tech company with several billion dollars of, of working capital and cash sitting on their balance sheet. That company really is in a position to retain a lot of risk and it doesn't need to be purchasing insurance that is perceived as costly for risks that they feel are very well controlled. If you compare that to say a, a uh, grocery store company that has very thin margins, tends not to have a lot of extra capital, doesn't have a lot of cash on hand, they're gonna think more carefully about the way they finance their risk and are gonna try to eliminate as much volatility as possible. Um, and, and the risk financing program design takes into account all those issues. The other, another key consideration is collateral. For certain lines of insurance, most notably workers' compensation and auto liability, these are compulsory lines of insurance where um, companies generally need to have uh, an insurance company provide a policy that, uh, that, that is primary and can evidence insurance for those coverages. And when there is a deductible in place, the insurance companies are going to require security in the form of collateral to backstop that underwriting, even if the organization is taking a large deductible. That collateral amount, um, which is usually provided in the form of letter of credit, sometimes in the form of cash trusts or surety bonds up to a percentage, this can be a very meaningful financial consideration. And so as you model out and think through different program structure designs, thinking through that collateral and what impact that has on a company's availability of credit and other, other financial factors is really important. A third, a third issue that I'll point to that we, I mentioned before are mark, insurance market conditions. 
So the amount of insurance that we buy and the amount of insurance that we retain is going to be clearly influenced by pricing in the insurance market. And that's impacted by lost trends and recent underwriting results, availability of capital um, to support insurance companies from external sources, an array of different factors. And as you go into any renewal process, it's critical that you think through all those issues clearly and have a good view on what the market conditions mean for the design of your program. And then finally, I want to talk about some of the operational aspects of risk management and how those impact risk financing strategy. In specific, claims management and uh, loss control or safety management um, and, and all of the different uh, programs that companies can put in place to avoid employee accidents and illnesses and uh, accidents and losses to, to third parties. Obviously, companies that have a very strong safety culture have very strong quality assurance around their operations and uh, their products are going to be in a better position to retain risk and are going to feel more confident in retaining both working layer and potentially excess layer risk relative to perhaps less mature organizations that don't have a robust, um, a robust plan for uh, managing losses when they come in. Um, the best practice, of course, is to have a, a clear way to manage claims activity, to develop key performance indicators, and to have accountability all the way through a company's organization for avoiding losses and then managing them to the best resolution when they come up. Um, but thinking, understanding your company's performance and strategy there is a critical factor in determining your risk financing strategy. Next, please. So I'm going to talk about what's going on in the casualty market generally. Um, and, and, and again, this is a, an important backdrop for how we think through risk financing strategy today. So in general, what we're seeing is a bifurcation of the market around underwriting performance and rate movement between workers' compensation and general auto liability and umbrella excess liability. We're going to talk about some of the, 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 the claims trend factors around third-party liability in, in a little while. Uh, but what I can generally share is that we have seen a, a continue, continued increasing frequency of losses and frequency of severe losses for those third-party li liability lines, general liability, auto liability, and umbrella excess. And th there are a number of factors behind that. We'll talk about those in a little while. But the impact there on insurance companies is insurance companies generally lose money writing auto liability and general liability insurance. The results on umbrella access have been somewhat of a mixed bag over the past several years, but it, it's it's been a tough run. And um, we started to see some improvement in underwriting results last year, and uh, particularly around auto liability. And the 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 pace of rate increases started to tick down a bit. Um, however, recent uh, underwriting data for the 2022 policy or 2022 accident year has emerged around auto liability showing that insurers have lost far more money than expected for that year and as a result have started to uh, demand higher rate increases on auto. Um, the, the umbrella rate increases have moderated a bit, but they still remain pretty consistent. And this is something that companies need to prepare for as they're going into the renewal process and, uh, and, and need to factor into their risk financing strategy. Workers' compensation is, the, is, is, is a divergent story. This is a, a, an area where um, last year in workers' compensation insurers posted a combined ratio, um, which refers to the amount of underwriting loss, the amount of losses paid and expenses divided by the premium. It's a gauge of insurer financial performance and underwriting performance. Uh, workers' comp insurers posted a combined ratio of 84%, which was the sixth year that that combined ratio had been below 90%, which is a benchmark for underwriting success. By comparison, the, the entire US PNC market operated at a combined ratio of 102%, meaning that they were paying $102 in losses and expenses out for every $100 of premium uh, collected, which obviously is a suboptimal situation to say the least. So it goes to show that workers' compensation is the, the crown jewel of the, the industry. It's an area where insurers are making money and are in a position that they can compete more vigorously and, and, 
and try to, uh, to win more business. You have to factor that competitive dynamic when we're developing the program to utilize competition on your workers' compensation program to attract more competition on the tougher parts of the program, the auto and the GL. Slide forward, please. So what's driving all of this activity, the, the, these difficult results around auto and general liability? I'm going to point to a theme that we've discussed in these meetings in prior years that continues to be a persistent issue, um, and that is the, the concept of social inflation. Social inflation is the phenomenon of increasing claims cost as a result of a, a number of different economic and societal factors. What are those factors? Um, a principal one can be observed driving around any city or up and down the freeways in, in essentially any part of the country. And that is an increase in plaintiff's activity. Um, again, you can observe that by seeing all of the, the plaintiff's lawyers that have billboards and bus stop advertisements that are on television everywhere. Um, essentially, plaintiffs and their lawyers have become much more focused and much more active in pursuing personal injury and personal accident cases against corporations. One of the factors that has empowered uh, claimants and plaintiffs and attorneys to do that is, is something called litigation financing, which is the private investment by various different pools of capital, private equity funds, hedge funds, uh, investors in litigation against companies. This uh, litigation financing industry grew 7% last year to $13.5 billion. Um, and essentially, this is a giant pool of capital that empowers uh, plaintiffs to pursue litigation against companies that they otherwise might have settled at lower amounts in the hope of getting what some people refer to as jackpot verdicts in courts. You know, we've seen a consistent increase in the number of large verdicts and, and, and as a byproduct of that, large settlements that companies make to settle, uh, to settle accident litigation. In some cases, you see really crazy judgments as much as, say, a billion dollars for trucking accidents um, and, and, and other uh, outlier situations that really has the public motivated to, uh, to pursue uh, cases that they perhaps not, might not otherwise. The other issue are sort of changing, the, another key issue is that changing societal attitudes about the responsibility that companies have to compensate victims of accidents. You know, because we've seen uh, a number of the, the, the amount uh, or the size of jury awards uh, tick up over time, and you have seen some of those headline uh, verdicts, courts are desensitized to large, uh, large judgments against companies. And whereas, you know, previous amounts of, you know, 10, 15, 25 million dollars to compensate someone for an accident might have seemed crazy, uh, juries don't blink at attorneys asking for much higher amounts than that. And and, you know, there are just simply changing attitudes um, with generational changes around social responsibility of companies and the public's interest in punishing companies that are involved in, in accidents. So th this is something that's underpinning all of this, uh, all of the, the underwriting results I just talked through and is really impacting insurance buyers and uh, insurance companies that provide protection for companies. Forward, please. So we've got some interesting analysis here that we've, we've boiled down into a great graphic that I'm gonna ask Terry to talk about. Terry, your team has analyzed a huge volume of claims data um, related to uh, related to auto liability losses. Auto liability is a great gauge for what's going on in the liability market and with claims activity because it's an exposure that spans a whole bunch of different industries. Can you talk us through the analysis that you did and some of the findings? Hey, thanks, Evan. Mean, yeah, um, so a little bit about this chart. Um, uh, what we're seeing here is... Uh, this chart is an analysis of catastrophic auto claims, both from a frequency and severity standpoint, going back to 2007. Um, these are for large claims, 15 million and greater. Um, and this represents the number of verdicts or awards and settlements for auto accident claims by disposition year, which is the year that the claim was fully resolved. Here, we analyzed 50,000 auto liability cases from the advising database and organized the data along this time horizon. Um, you know, we clearly see that, you know, there is not a perfectly upward trend line all the way from the past to the present. 
But what we do see in general is a significant upward shift in the number of large auto claims since 2013 with an average of 17 settlements that have happened over that time frame. In particular, if you break the history into four year windows, which is summarized in the upper left hand corner, you would see that in the first four year period, there were only 43 claims. Um, that rose slightly to 47 in the following period, which rose all the way to 69 in the 2015 2018 period. The aggregates uh, of 66 for the 2019 to 2022 window are not fully reliable due to the year 2020 being, a, being an unusual year because of the pandemic. We see how high the claim count rose in 2019, and then it dropped off significantly in 2020 when courts were closed. Well, the question we ask ourselves here is, even though we have seen lower numbers in the greener 2021 and 2022 disp disposition years, is that 2019 year representative or predictive of the new normal when it comes to litigation environment for large liability claim situations? And could we expect as these claims continue to work their way through the courts related to accidents that have happened in the past couple of years, are we going to see a higher number of dispositions in 2023, 24, and subsequent? Or did we just experience a spike in 2019 and we're just leveling off? Um, there's no doubt there's definitely an upward shift though. And I would say this trend is a bit concerning and creates a lot of pressure we see for umbrella liability and excess liability. Perfect. Thank you very much, Terry. Really interesting information. And I think you hit on a couple of key questions here, which is what does the future hold? And you know, one, one area of analysis I can point to is uh, some of the initial data around uh, the backlog of, of, of litigation in the court system. And you know, all indications are that the, the number of cases that we're seeing here in these more recent years are understated and we're gonna see a spike in the upcoming years. Slide forward, please. So how do we summarize the market challenges that we're dealing with and, and what that means for risk financing um, and, and risk financing strategy? I think we can point to workers' compensation being the primary focus of, of the casualty insurers and underwriters because it's such a reliable provider of underwriting profits. And as a result of that, we really want to use that as an anchor for the insurance program and a way to, uh, to attract capacity and, and get better than expected results for the tougher lines. All that being said, we should continue to expect increased auto general liability rates and umbrella rates for all but the most benign risks. So, you know, a, a benign risk would be something like a technology company or a, you know, a clerical office type exposure. Um, anything that has any meaningful auto fleet or hired non-owned exposure, any sort of uh, premises operations risk where you have a lot of exposure to the public coming onto your premises or any, any type of, of, of products liability risk is going to face this upward rate pressure as a result of the loss trends that we've talked through. We continue to see, uh, particularly for large companies, that is large being a billion dollars of revenue or more, um, or companies that, again, have big uh, auto exposures, um, we see increased the need to increase the attachment point for umbrella policies. And you know the way that you you facilitate that um, that umbrella attachment point at a higher level, moving it up from say two million primary uh, policies and umbrella attachment up to say a five million attachment is either buying buffer layers of insurance in the intervening layers, or by increasing the amount of risk taken on the bottom and bumping up the primary the primary limits. Um, these are all effective levers to pull, and something that insurers are demanding, uh, and that we have to be prepared for. And then, you know, one of the other issues that we're seeing, which is not so much a challenge, but something that has to be factored in to the, the calculus in designing the program, is what's gone on in the excess market. We've seen rates over the past several years for excess liability um, spike up as insurers got out of the market out of fear of some of these uh, factors of social inflation and nuclear verdicts. As a result, uh, underwriting suddenly became a lot more profitable for the higher part of excess towers. Um, and you have new insurers competing and providing the opportunity to remove some premium from the program via rate reductions once you get above, say, 25 million on a tower. And then the last thing I'll point to are some very specific underwriting concerns around specific exposures 
particularly presenting a mass tort potential um, for for insurance companies and for for large companies managing their own risk and purchasing insurance. The most noteworthy one I would point to now is PFAS, polyfluorinated or per, pure perfluorinated chemicals, also referred to as forever chemicals because of the amount of time they stay in the environment and in various uh, different types of materials. Essentially, PFAS have been linked via an array of, of studies to endocrine problems, cancer, infertility, a lot of other health issues. Um, PFAS is commonly used in a lot of consumer products, anything from weatherproof uh, clothing to uh, nonstick pans to other, it really gets into uh, cosmetics, lots of different things that, that touch humans and that uh, are, are in the environment generally. Um, and so what we're seeing are insurance companies really trying to understand their exposure to mass product liability claims related to, to PFAS um, or environmental issues related to PFAS. So for companies that have, have PFAS involved in their supply chain or in their products, this is going to be an issue uh, and something that has to be carefully uh, scrutinized. Um, another example of, of one of the risks that is concerning insurers a lot are social media um, issues, specifically addictive software programming uh, design allegations and litigation that essentially says that um, social media companies have designed software that uh, that it, it, by design um, gets people addicted to online activity and can create a lot of mental health issues. We're starting to see litigation around this area. Um, and it's something that underwriters and, and companies should be very focused on. Okay. So now we're going to talk about some of the particulars of risk financing uh, program design and the different options and what that means from both a cost and an operational perspective for companies. So if we think about the spectrum of risk financing options, at one end of the spectrum, you have the most conventional type of insurance, which is guaranteed cost, or also sometimes referred to as first dollar insurance. Um, and then at the far end of the spectrum, you have self-insurance, where companies are, are not buying any insurance at all and are essentially retaining as much risk as they can. Um, the, the advantages of first dollar insurance, guaranteed cost, at the low end of the risk spectrum are clear, right? Your, your insurance cost for a particular period are fixed at the premium you pay to the insurer. You could have zero losses, you could have a lot of losses, but the cost to you will remain fixed at that premium amount. Additionally, insurance companies under first dollar programs typically provide all the services associated with managing the, the risk, the claims administration, sometimes there's safety uh, consulting built into that. Um, it is as simple a program structure as you can design, requires the least amount of administration by uh, a company, um, and has the most predictability when it comes to uh, accounting and accruals. Um, there are the, the disadvantage, of course, is that you are fully funding your losses as well as the insurance company's profit and administrative uh, costs every single year with no ability to recapture underwriting profit if losses come in below the expected amount. In the middle of the, the risk spectrum, when it comes to risk financing options, are these risk sharing strategies, deductible plans and captive programs. We'll go deep on captives at the end of this discussion, but um, to touch on these two things initially, think of a deductible plan as akin to the deductible that you have on comp and collision on your personal auto policy. It is a way for you to retain the primary layer of risk, get the insurance company out of a position where they're having to pay for the first dollar of every single claim. And as a result on that, you get a premium credit for retaining some level of risk in your insurance program. It is common for large organizations to utilize deductibles um, and other retention mechanisms when you have a, a, a risk that is actuarially predictable, easy to understand, and something that you can have some reasonable confidence that you can accrue appropriately for losses within that retention. So think about something like workers' compensation as, as, as a line that would be helpful here, or, or for which deductible plans could be helpful. The 
advantages of, of utilizing a deductible plan, of course, are you're able to recapture some of that premium by retaining risk within the deductible. You tend to have more control over claims, both because the insurance company cedes some of the control over the claims administration process to you because you have skin in the game and, and you are responsible for the first layer of losses. Um, and again, there's the, the, the financial uh, advantage of being able to um, enjoy the savings that come from reducing your losses um, by retaining risk and not just handing premium over to the insurance company. The, the disadvantages or challenges related to large deductible programs really are, are, are two main areas as I see them. The first is the increased administrative burden that your company will have in taking on risk. You, you will have more of a vested interest and more control over managing your claims, but then you have to manage the claims. Um, you're also going to want to have uh, infrastructure within your team or via external resources like brokers or consultants to help you manage uh, accruals and uh, cash flow issues and billings related to all the losses within the deductibles. And while that is all very straightforward and can be managed, it does take some time and attention. And then finally, there's that collateral uh, issue that I talked about before. Insurance companies are um, responsible for, they're legally and financially responsible for the losses within the deductible layer that your company will, will maintain. Um, you, of course, agree to reimburse the insurer for losses within that deductible layer, but the insurer bears a credit risk that its, its policyholders will be able to repay those claims. As a result of that, they are statutorily required to uh, collect security in the form of collateral uh, to backstop those deductible layers. Um, and that security, as I said before, usually comes in the form of letter of credit, although there are other uh, instruments. But um, letter of credit has an opportunity cost of capital for companies in addition to a frictional cost of, of paying a bank to issue the LOC. So that is somewhat of an, a disadvantage. Captive programs are a spin on deductible programs. They can be either structured as group captives, where you pool your risk with a, a group of other companies, either in your industry or in a uh, heterogeneous pool of of businesses uh, from an array of different industries. And essentially the group captive would pre-fund, uh, would require you to pre-fund losses in the deductible layer, layer via a premium payment to the group captive um, and, uh, and, and, and then purchase excess insurance uh, as a group above that. Um, there, the, there is a level of risk retention and sharing here because again, the, that amount of, um, the, the group captive premium paid into the deductible layer uh, is adjustable based on your loss experience, but the group captive typically provides some level of aggregate protection in the event that losses in the deductible or working layer come in higher or lower than expected. And then finally, there's also uh, single parent captives, which are insurance companies that your company would own uh, to underwrite and finance your own risks. And in that situation, again, there is usually some level of risk sharing with the insurance market um, and is, a, is a, a, a more to the right on the uh, riskiness spectrum, but still provides some level of, of pre-planning and protection for companies. The most risky form of the uh, risk financing uh, structures is, is self-insurance. And there are certain areas where companies can opt to purchase no insurance at all. Um, in particular, the non-compulsory coverages. So say general liability is not typically statutorily required in the United States and companies can assess their own operations and exposures and simply choose to buy no insurance at all. Um, for workers' compensation, companies can apply to become qualified self-insurers uh, in, in most states and can opt out of the commercial work, workers' compensation scheme um, and can decide to retain all of that risk on their own. Um, the, the advantage here is this tends to be the least costly effective, the least costly option in terms of uh, risk transfer premium costs to pay to insurers. However, it does require the most administration. Um, it, it provides the least amount of protection against losses um, and the most amount of volatility. Let's slide forward, please. So again, this is a summary of, of the 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 different program designs and the key cost components. Each, com each strategy typically involves some level of premium and taxes and surcharges. 
Under guaranteed costs, there are essentially no variable costs. All of the cost is captured in the premium. With a deductible program, your variable costs involve uh, higher administration, claims handling expenses to manage losses within the deductible, the retained losses themselves, for which you have to have a good plan for actuarially understanding the losses um, and accruing for them, and then these collateral costs. Um, in a self-insured retention program, it's the same aspects, um, although the main difference is there tends to be less collateral um, under a self-insured program as insurers are not requiring a letter of credit or other collateral backstops. The states might, depending on the state and the situation, but all the variable costs of a deductible program are present with a self-insured program. From a, from a, there are important differences in both the timing of cash flows and the tax treatments of these different insurance program designs. Um, and, and we'll talk through a way to financially model that um, as we get in for deeper into the discussion. But the highlights here are that under a guaranteed cost or first dollar program, this is the most accelerated tax treatment of all the different insurance program designs. And what we mean by that is that your insurance premiums are 100% deductible within the year they are paid. Um, so if you have a million dollars of premium, that is a tax deductible expense for the policy year that can be uh, captured within that policy year. Um, additionally, all of your cash, all of the cost associated with the program, because it is captured in the premium, is paid within the first year. So you're able to accelerate the deduction from a tax perspective, but you have uh, a quicker cash flow uh, payout and a bigger cash flow impact within that year itself. Under a large deductible program or a self-insured retention program, you have a much more advantageous cash flow situation because the largest aspect of your insurance program costs are going to be losses within your deductible, your self-insured retention. And those, depending on the line of coverage, could pay out over a number of many years. Workers' compensation claims, most notably, can take 10 or more years to ultimately resolve. So you have a, a, a much improved timing of outbound cash flows. However, you also have less advantageous tax treatment. So again, under a guaranteed cost program, 100% of your program cost in the form of premium is deductible within the policy year. Under a deductible or an SIR program, you're able to deduct the excess premiums that you paid, but your biggest cost component is gonna be those retained losses which again, pay out over time, and you're only able to deduct the losses in the year that they are paid. Here, we wanna model, or we wanna illustrate for you just sort of the general flow of, cap, of, uh, of premium and capital through the different program structure options as a way to really drive home these basic concepts. The, on the left-hand side, you see the guaranteed cost structure, the most straightforward transaction, Policyholder pays an insured premium. They use that premium to pay losses, period, end of story. Under a deductible program, you have uh, you have that working layer. In this case, we've included an example of a $100,000 deductible. The policyholder provides the insurance company with collateral to cover losses, uh, to backstop losses within the deductible and enters into an agreement to reimburse the insurer for all losses paid within that deductible. And that's how the losses flow. And then for the excess insurance above the deductible layer, the policyholder pays the insurer premium and they pay losses above the deductible layer outside of that premium. And here you can see in this illustration, the policy has a $100,000 deductible and a million dollar limit, meaning the insurer's risk transferred layer is $900,000 excess of $100,000 for a total amount of available limit of 1 million. Under a self-insured retention program, there's a slight spin here. And that is the, the working layer, in this case, the $100,000 SIR is not a deductible. There's no insurance transaction. It is simply the lack of insurance, meaning that the policyholder agrees to pay 100% of any claim within the first $100,000 of loss. And then the insurer is providing a million dollars of limit above that $100,000 self-insured retention. The insurer has no obligation to pay any claims within the first $100,000, no legal or financial obligation. Therefore, there's no collateral required for that. Um, and this, this illustration also highlights an important point, which is um, whereas deductibles typically sit within, not typically, always sit within policy limits, 
insurance limits above self-insured retention stack. So you have $100,000 self-insured retention and that million dollar limit stacks on top, creating a total amount of limit available um, for this these layers of insurance of 1.1 compared to the 1 million with the deductible program. So here we're getting into really some of the fun stuff when you think about risk financing and how to model it and how to think through the pros and cons of different program structure options. This is one of the key exhibits that Terry and his team develop for our clients when we're helping them understand the pros and cons, both financial and strategic for different program structure options. Terry, talk us through the total cost of risk sensitivity analysis and why it's important. Hey, thanks, Evan. Um, so um, a lot of what we do um, with clients around uh, risk financing analysis is evaluating, evaluating an array of statistical outcomes on both a total cost of risk and an after-tax net present value economic analysis for different program options. Uh, you know, this is really important in getting a full picture um, and that trade-off between fixed cost savings via reduced premiums in exchange for taking a large deductible or self-insured retention and the additional potential costs in those unpredictable elements such as retained loss and claims handling expenses. You know, up on the screen um, is an example of a company um, that was considering moving to a 250K deductible option for their workers' compensation program as a way to recoup some of that premium from the market and build a program that is more cost-effective. Um, we're looking at the total cost of risk for the program going for, from a better than expected statistical outcome all the way to a worse than expected outcome with the extreme being a one in 100 worst case scenario, which is a 99th percentile. Um, we're looking at each different statistical outcome and assessing how the two programs, which is the guaranteed cost program and the 250K deductible program, those two scenarios compare from a total cost of risk perspective. Here, the guaranteed cost is you know, pretty easy to follow. Um, it's the flat line that goes from left to right. Um, there's no variability in that program, but the line is shift up or down depending on what's happening in claims experience. In order to determine the cost of risk, we have to look at each statistical potential outcome and build up the total cost, which includes the losses below the deductible or within the deductible, claims handling costs, surcharges, and also considering excess premium for the portion of risk transfer above the deductible. We would also think through collateral costs, as you know, Evan mentioned, associated with the letter of credit or other mechanisms that the organization is going to provide the insurer um, to secure the uh, deductible obligation. When you build all these together and you look at the outcome, you get a more dynamic picture of the total cost of risk analysis. And as you can see from this chart, the difference between the sloping line and the flat line shows that in a good to a somewhat adverse outcome, from a statistical perspective, this organization will save money on a total cost of risk basis by deploying a large deductible program in place of the guaranteed cost program. However, as we get to the more adverse outcomes, which is the end of the statistical spectrum to the right, about around the 85th confidence interval, uh, we see the two lines cross. And this is where the total cost of risk of both programs become equivalent. And as we move further to the right, we see the deductible programs um, the deductible program become more expensive than the guaranteed cost program. This is where the organization has to factor in working with a risk financing consultant and think through risk tolerance and if the potential savings is worth the potential additional cost of the adverse outcome. In this case, the answer would be that um, the large deductible program is the better program structure choice. Um, all the potential savings to the left of where the lines cross is much greater than the potential additional cost on the right side. Um, where the lines crosses at the 85th confidence, uh, confidence interval, and that's saying only in 15 out of 100 outcomes would the large deductible program cost more money relative to the guaranteed cost program. As shown in the bottom of the page, building a complete financial analysis of these programs and showing the net cost and savings of different statistical outcomes is also a very critical part of this assessment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, he, here is another view, uh, which 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 is which is labeling the net present value after tax aspect of the analysis between different risk financing uh, strategies. Uh, here, the goal is to think like a CFO 
and not just the costs we looked at in the prior slide, but we're factoring in cash flow timing and respective tax treatments. Um, in this scenario, we have an organization uh, that is weighing first dollar guarantee cost insurance versus a large deductible program where they're retaining uh, 250K uh, per claim on their workers' compensation program. This is similar to the prior example and builds up the total cost of the program, inclusive of not just premiums, retained losses, and letter of credit, but the difference here is it tracks the 10-year payout associated with the policy year. Since again, for a lot of the casualty insurance, including workers' compensation, losses are paid out slowly over time, and it discounts the total cost of the program back to the net present value based on the client's own cost of capital or their own discount rate, if you may, um, as well as makes a provision for the difference in tax treatments uh, for the different programs. Um, so for, for the guarantee cost program, as you can see here in the, in the, in the table, um, we're able to deduct 100% uh, of the premium in year one, which I think Evan hit on um, uh, earlier in the presentation, which we see in the bottom part of the screen on the left, right? So it's on the left, bottom left, if it's uh, hard to locate, uh, versus the large deductible program where we are only able to deduct losses and expenses as they are paid out. Um, under this scenario, if we factor all this in, um, you know, there's a better tax treatment for the guaranteed cost. However, we see that on a net present value as the tax basis, uh, the large deductible program is still the best choice. Thanks, Terry. The, the great analysis and great explanation. And what I think this really illustrates is how complex the risk financing uh, strategy setting process is, how many different variables there are, and the need to have a really clear way to financially assess, again, that trade-off between uh, different timing of cash flows, different tr tax treatments, and the trade-off between retaining risk and, uh, and, and recapturing premium savings. So thank you. Okay, so we, we understand what's going on in the market and all the challenges that we're facing. We understand the concepts of risk financing and the different strategic levers that we can pull. What do we do in today's market? And, and what are some of our, our key recommendations for companies as they go into the renewal process and think through risk financing strategy? The first is use whatever leverage you have. And the, the most common form of leverage that, in, that companies have today are is their workers' compensation program. Companies are better than ever at managing their risk, reducing the frequency of losses, the severity of losses by minimizing the duration of lost time claims and, and other, other strategies. Um, and as a result of that, insurers are making money on workers' compensation and are fighting hand over fist to, uh, to write more workers' comp. And so our recommendation is, you know, even if you have a great relationship with your incumbent workers' comp insurer, you need to think about conducting an insurer competition where you package the very attractive workers' compensation with the less attractive general liability, auto liability, and umbrella. That's the way that you're most likely to get better results on the tougher lines um, while still getting good results on the workers' compensation. Another area um, to think about, uh, the, another main point of leverage for, for companies is to utilize self-insurance. I often say that self-insurance is the best alternative uh, and the best threat to commercial insurance is thinking through ways to smartly uh, increase deductibles and retentions and recapture premium um, from insurance companies. And so the, the way to do that is to engage somebody like Terry to actuarially model loss expectations at different layers to understand how much marginal additional loss you could be taking on by increasing a retention. Um, and then using that uh, the savings that that comes from uh, increasing the retentions to either pay more to buy higher primary limits, redeploy that capital elsewhere in the program, or just just capture recapture some underwriting profit and improve uh, the financial picture of the program. Incumbent in 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 executing these strategies I just talked through is taking a really creative and strategic approach to collateral, right? Because again, what tends to happen with uh, large companies and their insurance programs over time is they build up a stockpile of collateral with a particular insurer. That insurer may give them some discount on the amount of collateral that they require to secure the program based on credit risk and the idea that the company is an ongoing customer. And then when you get to a point where you need to move your program, that 
legacy insurance company could make a call on the collateral and require you to provide even more um, while also having to give a new insurer uh, a pile of collateral in the form of letter of credit or some other instrument. So the way that you manage this process so that you can facilitate an insurance change where necessary is to very carefully focus on running off the old claims, closing them early so that you have less outstanding amount of loss requiring the collateral. Um, the second uh, point is to have a very clear and aggressive view of the actuarial loss forecast, again, developed by a credentialed actuary who can negotiate with both your legacy insurer and your go forward new potential insurers to, uh, to negotiate the amount of collateral down to as low as possible. And then the third part is think about some creative collateral funding strategies um, that are recently available in the insurance market. There are some, you know, it, for the past few years, insurers have been generally willing to accept a portion of uh, collateral in the form of surety bonds, which can have some balance sheet advantages and cost advantages for companies. You can also think about using a cash trust if letter of credit is problematic. And then more recently, uh, we've developed some strategies to have surety backed letters of credit where um, we align, arrange surety bonds to, uh, to backstop a letter of credit provided by a bank approved by the insurance companies to replace the traditional letter of credit. There are also some collateral replacement product, financial products where um, companies pay a financing company an amount, a rate equivalent to their term loan amounts uh, to issue letter of credit on their behalf in an off balance sheet transaction that doesn't encumber the balance sheet. So you have to think through all these different strategies to manage collateral, both to keep the total amount down and create flexibility. Um, finally, I wanna to touch on, uh, we, we've called out a couple of other things. I talked about increasing primary limits to increase the umbrella attachment, drive competition and, and decrease the price. And then finally, let's talk about captive really briefly. This is always a hot topic for, for companies particularly companies that are growing um, as a tool for best uh, managing their risk financing program. Slide forward, please. So to talk through this really briefly, a captive is a wholly owned subsidiary company that an organization forms to underwrite its own risks or the risks of third parties. And uh, there, are, there are a number of different strategic financial um, and potentially, in some cases, tax advantages to forming a captive insurance company. Essentially, the most common application of this is companies look at layers of risk that they're retaining um, or would like to retain via deductible or self-insured retention. And then they form a captive insurance company to underwrite that layer of risk, um, have losses prepaid into the captive via captive premiums. And they do this as a way to build up uh, capital in the captive, build up underwriting surplus, and extra risk capital that they can deploy to different aspects of their program. You do get uh, some of the strategic advantages called out on the right side of the slide here, similar to the ones that you would have with a large deductible or self-insured program, namely greater control over claims handling, loss control, et cetera. Um, and again, it, what where it really could be helpful for companies are in situations where there are difficult insurance problems to solve say your company has entered a line, a, 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 an operation where commercial insurance is unavailable, think about for a particularly hazardous product or something like that. Um, and having a, a wholly owned subsidiary uh, insurance company that has a lot of capital um, within that company can help you underwrite and pre-fund for losses that would otherwise be uninsurable. Slide forward. There are a number of different structures. We talked about group captives as a way to pool risk with other companies and take baby steps into retaining risks via a, a captive insurance company. Uh, there are also small insurance companies where uh, there are some additional tax advantages if you can keep underwriting below a certain threshold. I think it's a little bit north of $2 million today from an annual premium perspective. There's rent-a-captives where a company can partner with a captive sponsor company to rent a sell um, in, in, in an existing captive company um, that can save on some of the frictional costs of setting up a captive. And then the most common example, again, is the, the single parent captive where your organization would wholly own the insurance company, uh, be able to reap the financial uh, and strategic benefits and have the greatest amount of control. 
And then finally, we've talked through uh, the cash and capital flow of a traditional large deductible program. Let's look at it from a, a captive uh, a captive insurance program. The, the key difference here is that the insured sits in the middle between the deductible program and the captive program. And essentially in this scenario, we've modeled out a deductible reimbursement program where the captive essentially provides the parent company with coverage for losses within that deductible layer um, in the commercial insurance program, the parent company would pre-fund losses in the deductible by paying premium to the captive. The captive then would be responsible for paying all those losses within the retained layer um, and reimbursing the insurance company that is providing the commercial policy with the deductible. You might say, wonder, what is the financial advantage of all of this, uh, this, this, this additional transaction? It's that strategic benefit of pre-funding for losses and, pre and having a dedicated entity to really control your risk. There can also be some tax advantages because when the retained losses are converted into a captive premium, those are tax deductible, just like first dollar commercial premiums would be. Um, whereas with the traditional large deductible program, the retained losses are only deductible over time. And we, when we talk to our clients about this, we spend a lot of time analyzing that net present value after tax uh, cost difference um, in the different traditional program structures versus captive structures, similar to what Terry talked about a little earlier on in the discussion. So if I had to boil down, you know, how to think about captive and what are some of the issues here, um, I think the, the key thing I would ask you to walk away with is, is to remember that the value of captives can really come from two areas. One are the economic value of captive, which can come from this financial engineering and a change in the uh, in the accelerated deduction of loss reserves for tax purposes, or it can come from the strategic value, which it, are situations where the captive provides an insurance solution that wouldn't otherwise exist. And you know, as we think through uh, which what what lines of coverage and which attributes make forming a captive most attractive. We've called out some of them on the slide that's on the screen right now. The best place to start is with high frequency, low severity risks that pay out over a long period of time, such as workers' compensation, general liability, and auto. The reason for this is they're actuarially predictable. Um, the, the costs are easily understandable. And again, because the losses pay out over time, the time value of that accelerated deduction um, and, and the 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 impact of the discounting is much more pronounced than with other shorter tail lines of coverage. Um, lines that are challenging to write in a captive, although I've been getting a lot more attention because of some of the hard market conditions, are severity lines like property, directors and officers, and cyber insurance. You really need a lot of ca extra capital to backstop a captive if you're going to take those risks on because there's so much more unpredictability. But depending on your company's risk tolerance and financial strength, it can make sense to, to review that. And then finally, the, the, the biggest, I think, hurdle for most companies to stand up a captive is the, the motivation to do all the work and to deal with the upfront cost and capital requirements to form the captive. Remember, owning a captive means you are entering the insurance business and owning a regulated insurance company. That takes time, that requires time and attention from your executives, your finance, legal, risk teams, um, it requires typically a quarterly review of financial statements and underwriting performance, and it can all serve strategic and financial benefits, but require some upfront investment of time and capital. We've called out, so we've talked through some of the reasons to, to start a captive or to consider a captive. Now I'll talk very briefly on the timeline and the workflow, if it is something that you're interested in. The typical process involves completing a feasibility study where you financially model a captive program versus more traditional programs, look at capital requirements, premium funding requirements, other issues, um, potential domiciles where the captive should be located, some of the tax and legal considerations. This process takes about two to eight weeks. Um, from there, the feasibility study is typically reviewed by a company's leadership team. At that point, they make a decision if they want to move forward with the captive. The feasibility study then becomes the uh, becomes the basis for the business plan that is filed with the regulator and the captive domicile. Um, and the, the process of having that captive approved by the regulator and 
uh, and formed in, in terms of filing legal documents, setting up banking relationships, all those issues, that can take one to four months. Um, and then again, there is an annual uh, and in some cases quarterly workflow that needs to be undertaken to continue to maintain the captive once it's, once it's established. This is all a long way of saying that again, captive can be very useful for companies who are trying to solve an insurance program or have a set of financial attributes where they can reap some of these potential financial advantages, but it is a somewhat involved process that really should begin at least six months prior to the effective date of any uh, conceptual captive program. And that's all that we've got. We're a couple of minutes over. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, the next presentation that we'll be conducting in this PNC 101 uh, uh, series is gonna be cyber liability, which will be presented on October 19th, a week from today. Uh, again, we thank you for your interest in risk financing and taking some time this morning to geek out with Terry and I on some of the risk financing, risk financing strategies and quantitative analysis that, that we love to do with our clients. Um, should you have any questions, uh, please contact new experts at Woodrow Sawyer, and we look forward to seeing you the next time.